السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته دي سلانج سنتر اوف جلينديل ويلكم دي كوميونيتي فور دي اور ساتردي نايت بروجرام توداي از سبيشال بروجرام وي ار هافينج دينر اند فاند ريزنج فور دي اور نيو اكسبانشن بروجكت دي تشيرمان اوف ذا وورلد ويل توك اباوت ات افتر دكتور احمد صبح هي از دينتست باي بروفيشن اسلامي اكتيفست باي نيتشر هي از هيد اوف دي تشينو اسلامي فالي اند هي كيم اول ذا واي from Chino and uh, an hour drive. Excellent lecture, alhamdulillah. Very well dedicated. Uh, father of how many children? Three. Three children, beautiful children. You can see them uh, on Facebook. Today he is going to talk us about the family relation in Islam in view of Luqman's advice. And uh, inshallah after that, uh, we'll have the project uh, details by the chairman, brother Saraga al -Khair. After that, talk by Sheikh Saad al Tegu, inshallah, and after that will be Asha Breer and dinner. So enjoy the, uh, the lecture. Any questions will be at the end, inshallah, of the lecture. Thank you very much. Salam <coughs> رسول الله أفضل المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وعلى تابعيه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. It is uh, <coughs> my pleasure to be uh, with my uh, brothers and sisters in this beautiful community. When he's done, inshallah. Uh, it's uh, a blessing to see the masajid growing and building their properties and increasing the size of their spaces and that's a good sign alhamdulillah right now if you compare it how it used to be 50 years ago you'll see a lot of people will tell you we used to drive every Sunday for an hour or half an hour to go to LA or to Garden Grove to pray Dohor uh, or to teach our kids at Sunday school now alhamdulillah I was driving on my way on the 210 freeway and I can count on every uh, less than 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes, there's a message you can exit and pray a prayer and then keep going. This is all a blessing, alhamdulillah, and it's a good uh, gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So those who are like me, who are new to this area or moved to Southern California in the past uh, 15 years, they don't appreciate this blessing. But I'm sure all of you who've been here for a long time you know the difference and you know how beautiful it is right now to be in a community full of masajid and full of uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, I was asked to come and talk about something extremely critical in our lives, which is the family relationship and parenting and uh, how children should deal with their parents and parents should deal with their children. But uh, <clears throat> there is a verse in the Quran in Surah Al-Furqan, at the end of Surah Al-Furqan, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala describes a group of people. He says, these are Ibadul Rahman, the great servants of Allah, Ar rahman And he gives description of each one of their characteristics. One of their characteristics at the end, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعِمْ They always pray to God. They say, oh Allah, give us righteous spouses and righteous children. So having righteous children and righteous family is on the top priorities of any Muslim individual. It's on the top of our mind. We want to have good families. I mean, if you ask any of you, what's your worst fears? It's not to lose your business. It's not to lose money. The worst fear is to lose your children, right? And we hear those stories right and left. And when I came, before I came to the States, everyone was telling me, when you get there, your kid's going to be gone because we met a guy whose name is Charlie his last name is Muhammad and when you ask him where did you get the last name he said my grandfather was a Muslim and it's just watered down but alhamdulillah on the other side the things that I've seen 
that these new generations, the brothers and sisters, the young brothers and sisters who are committed to their faith and to their masajid, they are becoming better than their parents, right? Who, who's an immigrant from the subcontinent here, from the India or Pakistan? Who's, who reads Quran better, you or your children? Right? Definitely. You ask the brothers who come from the Middle East, who practice the ethics and the morals of Islam better, you or your children? You'll find that the children, alhamdulillah, our children, if we are taking care of them in the right way, they become better, and then their children, inshallah, will become better, and they will get on the shoulders, of the shoulders, and they build the community, inshallah, to a higher level with the effort and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our children and to give us the ability to take care of them and raise them up in the best way. I'm going to share with you some of the tips on how to deal with your children, especially the teenagers. I deal with the youth a lot. I have a weekly gathering with the youth in my community and I have a monthly gathering with the youth in other communities. So I deal with teenagers all the time. <coughs> And the things that I hear from them and the things that they say to me, I wish I can open the eyes of the parents for them without uh, losing the trust of those young boys and girls. I hear things from kids, I wish I can say to the father, wake up, this is what your daughter is telling me. Wake up, this is what your mother, what your son is telling me. But I cannot do that. So what I decided to do is go and find out some tips and advice from our faith, from our religion, that I can share it with the parents so they can apply them in the way they deal with their children. And when I do this, I also teach myself. You know, I, there's a very famous story about a man who went to a sheikh and asked him, Ya sheikh, teach me how to raise up my son. He said, how old is your son? He said, oh, he's too young, he's only one years old. The sheikh told him, you are too late. You came to ask now? You should have asked before you got married. You should have asked before you chose whom to get married to. So. For me, the moment I <coughs> had my first child, I started doing the research and reading, and this is one of the ways of teaching myself before sharing with you these advice and these tips, inshallah. Before I start, I would like to ask a question. Why do we have to learn about how dealing with our children? Why is it, is it, is it important to, to raise up our children to be good people? Is, is that a silly question? Are our kids important? Yes, right? Anyone has any doubt about that? I hope 100% of you say yes. Now, why? Why are our kids important? It's kind of instinctive. It's instinctive. What exactly? So, what is the reason that you, your kids are important for you? What's that instinct? What do you feel towards them? Their well-being, overall well-being. You know, that's love. Grow up. love. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. The love that we have to our children is more than the love that we have to any other human being, living human being. We love our children more than we love our own selves. How many times your two-year-old came to you and you were grabbing the food and you're putting it in your mouth and they looked at you with sad eyes, they want to have it, and you just direct it to their mouth, happily, without even feeling that you missed something. The love that we have to our children is so strong that we love them more than our own selves. If I go and ask any of you in your profession, if you're a consultant, you said, right? And if I tell you, but there is a consultant better than you, you'll feel jealous. There is no doubt about that. You'll feel bothered. I'm a doctor. If you come and tell me there is a doctor who's better than you, naturally, I will feel bothered. If I go to the sister and say, you know what? Your food is so good, but your sister-in-law cooks better than you. Don't say that to your wife. You'll be in big trouble. You'll sleep on the couch that night. There is that this human nature of jealousy or we don't like to be compared to others, we don't like it, except in one situation. When I tell you your son is a better consultant than you, my daughter is a better doctor than you, your daughter is a better engineer than you, or you're better cook than you, or a better mother than you, or a better father than you, at that time you feel proud. You'll be happy. Yes, my son is better than me. I'm not sad at all. I'm extremely happy that my son... Why is that? Because we love them so much. But that's the only, only one reason why they are important. What's another reason? Why are they important? Why are we sitting down listening today to something like this? What is so important about our children? Sisters, any answers? 
Why your children are important? <clears throat> because they are a man. When you take care of your children, it's not because you want to. It's because Allah asked you to. Because it's your responsibility to raise them upright. It is your responsibility to feed them healthy. It's your responsibility to take them to the doctor. It's your responsibility to give them the best education you can afford. It's your responsibility to take them to the Masjid teach them Quran and Islamic manners. That's your responsibility. And if you do not do that, you'll be asked about it on the Day of Judgment. كُلُّكُمْ رَاعٍ وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ Each one of you going to be asked about your shepherd. You're a shepherd and you'll be asked about your, 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 the people you're taking care of. So that's the response of one of the great sheikhs, uh, I forgot his name, I think his name is Zakaria Siddiqui. He was asked once, how many children do you have? You know what he said? I have with me for Allah seven children. Look at the word he said, for Allah. They are not mine. Allah entrusted me with seven children. That's what he said. Because they are an amana. And that's another reason why we have to actually look and study and learn how to deal with our children. Number three. The reason our children are important because they are a good source of what? Income? No. Hasanat. Good deeds. We all know when we die, our good deeds will stop counting, except through three ways. One of them is a righteous son or a righteous daughter. If you, your son, you teach your son to take care of this masjid. And after you die, to build this masjid, to make it a bigger place and a much better place, you get the reward of all these deeds. There's a story about a man, a person, goes on the day of judgment, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them a huge mountain of good deeds. That person will say, Oh Allah, where did I get all these good deeds from? I know myself, I'm not that great. I did not do all these good deeds. Allah will say, you did not, but you raised up a son or a daughter who did all these good deeds and you get the credit for it. So there is a good source of good deeds by raising up our children in the right way. And finally, they are the future of our ummah. They are the future of our community. They are the ones who are going to take care of the masajid when we go. They are the ones who are going to keep Islam and Muslim community strong after we go. Now, alhamdulillah, many of the older communities, they see how the second generation are taking, taking over and handling the masajid and handling the organizations. And inshallah, your children and my children will be on the top of the list when it comes to doing this activism and work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa So these are four reasons why it's important and then you might think of other reasons but just are simply four reasons I thought of why is it important for us to sit down and learn how to deal with our children and how to raise them up. And by the way, raising up, raising up a child is not easy. To bring up a child is not a simple task. Yeah, it's easy to teach the child how to eat and drink and how to cross the street and how to dress and how to write. That's easy. Easy to teach a child how to survive, that's easy. But to bring up a productive individual to the society, a successful husband, a successful wife, a successful father, a successful grandfather, this is how we should think. Unfortunately, all what we think, I want my son to get into college and get married. After that, I don't think about it. How do you think of your son 40 years from now as a father, as a grandfather, as a doctor? He's only gonna be a doctor or the head of the hospital? He's only going to be a lawyer or the Supreme Court judge. We should think that way. And in order for them to achieve those high goals, we need to learn and study and read. Whether it's Islamic books and Islamic resources and non-Islamic resources as well. There's so many websites and articles online and books tells you how to deal with your children in certain situations and how to bring up the best out of your children. Your duty as a father is to read these things, is to research these things instead of spending hours watching TV every day, spend half an hour every other day reading how to deal with your children, how to make them the best human beings and the best individuals. That's your responsibility as a parent. That's why we need to start learning about these things. Now our children go through so many phases. There are phases when they're still children. There are phases when they're in the early teens. There are phases when they're still knowing how to play around. And our religion taught us how to deal with the children in many of these stages. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gave us beautiful examples how to deal with young children. How he cared about the psychology of the child. How he cared about the, 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 the mentality of the child. You know, in the, in, the, in the best times of the Islamic civilization, Ibn Battuta, you know Ibn Battuta? The famous traveler. 
He traveled around the world and he wrote down in his book what he saw. He said, I was walking in the streets of Beirut. That's in the best time of the Muslim civilization. He said, I saw something amazing. When I was walking in the streets of Beirut, a kid was holding a pot. And while he was walking in the streets of Beirut, he dropped that pot and it broke. Now this kid is in trouble. His dad or his mom gonna take it on because he, he broke something valuable. You know what happened when he fell and he broke it? Immediately, the merchants of the uh, market gathered around him. They collected the broken pieces of the pot and they took him to a special organization in the town called Waqful Fakhura. Read about it. Waqful Kasura or Waqful Fakhura. A non-profit organization. The name of it is the organization of the broken pot. You know what they do? They take the broken pieces of the pot and they give back a new piece to the child so his father won't yell at him. So his mother won't get angry at him. Look how important the psychology of the child was. That's all from the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. How did he dealt with the children? How did he dealt with this person and that person? And there are so many examples through Allah, the life of Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, how to deal with young children. Maybe we can talk about that in a different lecture. But when your son reaches a teenage, or what we call it, Sinnu al 12, 13, 14, up to 19 years old, this is a different ball game. This is a different philosophy, different technique, different method, totally different way of dealing with your son when it comes to that age. He's not a little child anymore. He's not a baby anymore. According to Islam, when your son or your daughter reach puberty, they are adults. They have to pray, they have to fast, they have to pay zakat, they have money. They are adults. They are, might not be mature adults, but they are in the adulthood. They start in the adulthood. So we as Muslim, we teach, we should deal with them in a different way. And when they pass the age of 19 and 20 and they get into college, that's a totally different ball game again. I get so many parents of my, my youth group are until high school. After my group is over, after the kids are out of my youth group, they get into college. Every year, it doesn't fail. Parents come to me and say, please help me, my son is gone. It's like, yeah, sister, brother, your son and daughter in college. It's a different story. Give them some room. Let them make decisions. Let them make mistakes. That's a different time for you. You cannot treat them the same way you treated them when they were 15 or 16 or 17. So what I'd like to share with you today, a little guideline, a little protocol that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put for us in the Quran when he was telling us how to advise your son or your daughter when they are teenagers. Now it doesn't say how to deal with them if they do something wrong. It doesn't say how to deal with them. But these are simple advice. It doesn't say everything. I'm going to share with you these little advice. Ten, maybe nine advice from Luqman alayhi salam to his children, to his son, how to behave and how to become a better person. These advice are general advice, but they are in many steps and they are detailed a little bit. But it is very common that Luqman used to advise it all the time. So what I would like you, us to do today is remember these advice. You can go to the Quran and find them and make sure you keep reminding your children with these advice all the time. Fathers and mothers, especially mothers, especially sisters. When we talk about these things, when we talk in Khutbat al Jum'ah, by the way, and I'm so happy that you open the curtain between the brothers and the sisters. Because in my opinion, the stock that the khatib gives or the lecturer gives, it goes way further when a sister hears it. Because when the brother hears it, he applies to himself. When the sister hears it, she goes to teach her children. She reminds her husband. She reminds her brother. And I mean, the best example, when you sit down on the table for dinner, most of the time, if not all the time, it's the mother who reminds everyone, say Bismillah. They say the dua. Because that's the nature of the mother. So, these advice, parents should always keep reminding their children. If you're not married yet, that's good. Now you know about this before, it's too late. You keep reminding your children with this advice. So this advice is in Surah Luqman. Surah Luqman is in uh, the 21st chapter of the Quran. And only one page of it talks about this advice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ 
We have given Luqman wisdom. Who is Luqman? Luqman is a very wise man during the days of Prophet Musa alayhi salam or a little bit around that time. He was from Africa, an African man who is extremely intelligent and wise according to who? According to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala certified him as a wise man. Luqman is a wise man. So what does that mean? When you hear, I tell you, this individual is an expert in this kind of medicine or this field of medicine. You go ask him when you have questions about this problem. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, Luqman is a wise man, we should listen. What is he going to say? We should learn. What does he have to say? And by the way, that's, that's, that, there's a major problem going on in the society around us. That we are listening to the famous people, not to the wise people. If you open the TV, you'll find interviews and show talks interviewing people simply because they're famous. Actresses and actors and basketball players and they ask them tough questions. And the kids are listening. And they are listening to the advice of people, sorry, they're dumb. Most of the times. But because they're famous, people are listening to them. And that's a problem. You seek wisdom. You seek advice from people of wisdom. And that's one of the things that we're doing tonight. And by the way, the celebrity issue is also in our Muslim community. It happens every single time. I go give a khutbah. And people come and ask me questions after the khutbah that I have no clue how to answer. One day... A guy came to me after the khutbah. I'm giving a khutbah, a talk about something. I forgot what was it about. A guy came to me after the khutbah asking me how to open an engineering firm. So I'm a khatib. I know you liked my talk. I love, you like my speech. But does not make me a person who understands everything? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when they came and asked him about how to farm a land, what did he say? هذه أمور دنياكم. So take it easy on the shuyukh. Take it easy on the khutaba. Because unfortunately, not all of them are able to restrain themselves from giving and talking about things they don't know. The khatib will give a nice talk, everyone will come and ask him a question. And the khatib, MashaAllah, he will start talking about things, Ma anzalallah fatawa that balawa, as we say. Ma anzalallahu biha min sultan. Things that he not, I will lie, I was sitting down and the khatib was talking about dentistry in front of me because someone asked him about his tooth. And he said, like, what are you talking about? You have no clue what you're talking about. But simply because people like this khutbah, people like to ask questions. So take it easy. If you want to ask a question, ask a question from someone with his expertise. If he's a sheikh of fiqh, ask him about fiqh. If there is a doctor, ask the doctor about medicine. If there is an engineer, ask him about engineering. If you have a, a, a children or family matters or a, a, a lot of marriage situation, people get asked about, go ask a marriage consultant. A counselor, who has a, a, a children uh, consultant, that's much better than asking someone just simply because they have a nice khutbah. Back to the top. So Luqman is a wise man, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us indirectly, listen to him what he has to say. But something very nice he said after that. Anishkur lillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we've given Luqman hikmah, wisdom, so Luqman, be thankful to Allah. If you are wise, if you are smart, if you are intelligent, you should thank Allah. Don't say I'm rich because I'm a smart businessman. Don't say I'm rich because I'm a smart doctor. Don't say I am uh, smart, uh, I am intelligent more. This is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How many smart engineers and smart doctors and smart businessmen around the world and they live in poverty? Smarter than you and me and they're poor. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave you the ability to go to this school, to put you in this situation, to open this business, to become rich. It's Allah who gave you this intelligence that you have. So when you think you are smart, always say Alhamdulillah. And you're driving on the freeway. This is a simple a practice that all of us should do. You're driving on the freeway and the car in front of you did something really stupid. It's really foolish. The common comment from everyone to say, look how dumb this person is. The right comment should be, Alhamdulillah, I know better. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me mind to think better than this person and be better than him. It's a blessing from Allah. Don't make it, 
Don't be arrogant because of your intelligence and smartness. It's a blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, ushkur lillah, anishkur lillah. Be thankful to Allah, O Luqman. Then, Luqman start talking and giving advice to his son. وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِضُهُ And look at this word, يَعِضُهُ Luqman started talking to his son while he's preaching to him. Wa'ad. Wa'ad. Sometimes some parents are shy from giving advice to their children because their children are going to say, Mom, you're boring. Dad, you're boring. It's okay. It's your job to be a boring father. It's your job to be boring mother by the advice. They might not like it now, but 40 years from now, 30 years from now, they're going to say, oh, my mother used to tell me this all the time. They're going to forget that it was boring, but they're going to remember that you've been telling them, don't do this, do this, don't do this. How many brothers or sisters, you know them, they start praying at the age of 50 or 40? Many. And you ask them, why did you start praying? My mother, before she died, all my young age, she was always telling me, pray and pray. But if you ask him, then he did not like it. Now it comes back to them. So it's your job to give advice to your son. Yes, have fun with them and play with them and have some with them. But when you give advice, do not compromise on the advice because you don't want to sound boring to them. And repeat over and over and over again until it sinks in their minds. They will use it later on, inshallah. وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ The first advice that Luqman is giving his son, لا تشرك بالله Do not have shirk. Do not associate other gods with Allah. Now, how many of you actually sit down with your children and say, La tushrik billah? Honestly. How many of you sit down with your children and say, Do not worship anyone but Allah? Is your household better than the household of Luqman? Is your household better than the household of Prophet Ibrahim and Prophet Ya'qub? Ya baniya inna Allah astafa lakum uddeen fala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Do not ever think that things are for granted. You need to keep reminding your children it's one God. Allah is the true God. There is no other God. There is so much confusion happening among the kids nowadays. I, a few months ago, a father comes to me with his 12 years old daughter. Why? Because she found Jesus. A lot of, there is a lot of propaganda going against us as Muslims. There's a lot of bad things are talked about us as Muslims on the TV and the radio and the internet and everywhere. And your children are exposed to it more than you can imagine. Now those people, they know that's not going to affect my heart. When someone come and say Islam is a bad religion, it's not going to make any difference on me. I'm convinced, mashallah, aqeed is strong, iman is strong. But your 12 year old daughter, what do you think is going to happen to her when she hears these things? And you're not telling her Islam is the right religion. Islam is a true religion. Keep reminding your children, do not be shy of saying that. Do not associate others with Allah. In other words, Tawheed. <coughs> the word Tawheed, by the way, uh, nowadays it became a scary word. Once I attended the lecture for 35 minutes or 40 minutes, the title Tawheed. I did not understand one or nothing whatsoever. There's so many people, Tawheed, Tawheed, Tawheed is the beautiful principle of Islam. But simply it means, when you want to make dua, pray to Allah. If you're going through some financial hardship, my son, do not go beg the bank for money. Ask Allah for rizq. When you're going through hardship, my daughter, with your husband, do not go call the cops. Patient and ask Allah to solve the problem. When you are going through some, ask Allah. When you are scared from something, do not change your name from Muhammad to Mike. Ask Allah to protect you. My daughter, when you are afraid, do not take off the hijab. Ask Allah to protect you. That's true Tawheed. That you're only asking Allah to protect you and you're only asking Allah to provide for you and you only worship Allah. So keep reminding your children with this main principle of our religion, Tawheed. Do not worship anyone but Allah. Allah is the true God. Islam is the best religion. Keep teaching them these things. That's very important for you to tell your children and do not think that your children are immune from any of these things that's happening around us. So that's the first advice. Is Luqman is saying it over and over to his child, to his son. And number two, and it's very, very important. وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ Oh my son, Allah had asked you to take care of your parents. A lot of parents do not give that advice to their children. And they get upset or sad why my son is yelling at me or arguing with me or mistreating me. 
it is your job as a father or a mother to keep reminding your children to respect their parents. When you're sitting down on the dinner table and your children are sitting down and the food is there and your son puts the spoon in his mouth and he eats from the food that his mother cooked and he says, ew, I don't like it. It's your job as a father to say, what are you doing? Didn't you know that by saying that you just hurt your mother's feelings? Don't you know when you, when you do a project and you go to your teacher and your teacher says it's not a good project, how do you feel? That's how your mother feels when you do that. When, you, when, when, you, when the father buys something to his son, a pair of shoes or a t-shirt, and the daughter comes to you, oh mother, and say, oh mom, this is too ugly, I'm not gonna wear it. Tell her, don't say that, your father just bought you this. Your father sacrificed time and money to buy you this. It's your job and responsibility to be thankful and don't give him, give him a kiss and a hug and say, thank you, daddy. When daddy's taking some time off work and planning for a picnic in the park, and the kid is sitting down texting his friends, I'm, so, I'm, I'm bored, I'm sitting down with my father and mother and bored and all that. This happens whether you like it or not. That's how children do. It's your job as a mother to go to son or daughter and say, what are you doing? Your dad took the time off so we can have some family time. Do not talk like this to your dad. Do not talk like this to your mom. It's your job as parents to keep reminding your children to respect their parents. Look, man, that's what he's doing. And that's the second advice. And reminding them, reminding them of their young age remind them that when you were children your mother stayed up all the night because you were sick your mother had back pain for so many years because she was pregnant with you your father did that when you were young your mother did that when you were young remind them of their young age and the and the things that their parents did so they always appreciate that so that's the second advice as a father or a mother keep reminding your children to respect their parents which is you do not say, I'm not supposed to. No, you're supposed to do that. Number three. After several advice, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even saying, even if your parents are so bad to the point they do shirk, you still give them good companionship. You still be nice to them. And I get that question from many of the converts, the brothers and sisters who become Muslims at a later age. They come say, my mother is not a Muslim and she's given me a hard time. Your job is to treat her nicely regardless of what she's doing to you. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this surah. And then Luqman is telling his son something very important. Ya innaha in habbatin min khardha. He's teaching him a very important principle self-accountability he's saying even if it's a small seed of mustard very tiny that's hidden somewhere in the heavens and the earth Allah will bring it forward on the day of judgment and Allah will show it to you on the day of judgment and say look what have you done on that day on that night on that hour everything is exposed on the day of judgment in details teach your children Teach your sons and daughters that everything you do, Allah is watching it. Not, you're not doing this because I'm watching. You're not doing this because I am there. Otherwise, when they get to college, once they get on campus in the dorms, they're going to do the things, the bad things, because you're not there to watch them. But if you teach them all the time that Allah is watching them, when you do something wrong, Allah is going to record it and it's going to be shown on the day of judgment. They will do wrong things, but as long as they have this understanding they will always try their best to avoid the wrong things and by the way since we're talking about this do not expect your children to be angels they will do mistakes in high school and college they will do mistakes and some of these mistakes might be major mistakes doesn't mean you throw them out of the house doesn't mean you say you're not my son or not my daughter anymore no you keep that rope one day they will come back inshallah they are not angels. Yes, be patient. It's painful. But they will do mistakes, whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not. They will do mistakes. You did mistakes as a teenager. You did mistakes in your college life. What do you expect your children to be? Just keep the door open so when they decide to come back, you are there waiting for them when they come back. So tell, teach them self-accountability, that Allah is watching everything that they are doing. I'm going to go really quickly in the last few advice. And then the reminder, Ya Bunaya Aqimis Salah. Oh my son, establish salah. 
This is the most important thing in our lives as Muslims. The most important ibadah, salah. A lot of fathers, they don't care if his daughter is praying or not, but he will raise up hell if she's not wearing the hijab. He doesn't care if his son praying or not, but if he's not eating the biha, he's a kah. You have to put you have to put priorities. It's okay, yeah. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay, Habibi. Uh, it's important to put priorities in life. It is not right to fo force your children to do the minor details and you forget about the major things. The most important thing in ibadah is salah. And keep reminding them, now do not go fight with them about salah because they will hate it and they will not want to do it. And by the way, the hadith of teach your children to pray at seven and وَضْرِبُوهُمْ عَلَيْهَا لِعَشَرْ Unfortunately, that's a hadith a lot of the fathers think that's the most important hadith in the world. When their children are 10 years old, tomorrow's your birthday, I have the stick ready. <laughs> and I would like to use a different understanding. For the word اضربوهم, I like to use الزموهم. Because the word ضربة could be used as الزام. وضربت عليهم الذلة والمسكنة. A lot of scholars say no, it means physical disciplining. But me personally, I like to choose that in this time, in this life, in this country. Use disciplining your children at the age of 10. But there are ways to encourage them to do that. Your son will get his driving permit at the age of 15, right? Tell them, now you have your permit. Every time you go to the masjid, you're going to drive. He's going to be awake at 5 a.m. in the morning, every day. Because he's going to drive to the masjid. And that will be good for both of you to come and attend Fajr prayer. And he'll be waiting for you at Isha because he wants to drive to the masjid. Encourage them with these simple things. After we pray, we're going to go have ice cream together. I do that with my seven-year-old. Every time he gets me to the masjid, we go to the gas station and buy hot chocolate. He loves it. I don't care why he comes, for the hot chocolate or the salah, but at least he's coming with me. Encourage them and get some temptations for them to get used to the habit of salah. And do not lose your tempers when you advise them. They might miss salah. Don't get angry. Don't start yelling and screaming. Keep saying, did you pray? Yalla salah. Did you pray? Let's pray together. When he learn a new surah and his voice is nice, let him be the imam. Let him lead the salah. He will love it more and he will want to do it even more often. So, but even if he's not, when he reached now college age and he's not following your advice and he doesn't want to pray, do not stop telling him salah, salah, salah. It will hit him back one day when he stops playing around and fooling around at that age. After he gets married and he has his children or here, they will inshallah get back to it. So do not stop giving them the advice like Luqman. Luqman, we think he's a righteous man, he doesn't have, no, he's giving the advice of Salah to his son, who should be as righteous as him. <coughs> <coughs> the next advice, another thing that we need extremely, necessarily, and very important advice in the time that we're living in. Ya Bunaya, wa'amur bil ma'rufi wanha'an al Oh my son, command goodness and forbid evil. What do we have a term for it in America? Al-Amr al-Ma'ruf wa al munkar What is it called in American culture? It's called activism. To be an active. Do not scare your children from being active on campus in colleges. If many of you came from, an, uh, from the Middle East, we come with the mentality of fear. Be quiet and just move on. No! Your children do not have that fear, so do not put it in their hearts. Let them be active in school. Let them, if they see something wrong, to speak up against it. If, see, if they see a big guy bullying a, lot, a younger guy, go and stand up and say about it. No, that's not right. Speak up and do not be scared. Yeah, you can run and go to the bathroom afterwards, but speak up and be strong when you are speaking against injustice. On campus, be part of these movements that speak against injustice, whether it's in abroad or in, 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 the, in the country. Let them be brave and speak against injustice. وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْهَ عَنْ المنكر. But when you give them that advice, you have to put another advice after that. What is it? وَاصْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أَصَابَكَ Because when you decide to be an activist, when you decide to say the good thing and to speak against injustice, you're going to go through some trouble. So be patient. How many of us actually sit down with our teenage children and tell them, be patient? We live in a society that patience is not something encouraged. We sit down in the restaurant, we order food. If the food is 10 minutes late, the parents are complaining before the children. 
Next time the children will pull out their butane cells, where is my food? Where is my food? No. Be patient, son. Be patient, daughter. Teach them to be patient. When they get married and they come to you, your daughter comes to you telling you, my husband is not treating me well. Don't tell her, stay with me until he comes and apologize. Say, be patient, my daughter. When your son comes to you and tells you, you know what, I'm having a hard time with my wife. Don't tell him, I'll get you a better wife. That's a very common Arabic term. <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Be pa patience is a solution. Teach your children that patience is a solution for the problem. It could be one of the solutions of big problems to be patient and the reward insha'Allah is very big. Next, after that, now Prophet uh, 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 Luqman is given an advice about social manners. وَلَا تُصَعِّرْ خَدَّكَ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَمْشِي فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَحَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَارٍ فَخُورٍ Do not turn your face away from people with arrogance and do not walk conceited around. Indeed, Allah does not like those who are arrogant. How many of us actually sit down with our children and tell them, be humble? Be humble. كُنْ مُتَوَاضِعًا كُونِ مُتَوَاضِعًا We actually do the opposite. When we talk to our daughters, you have to marry the best doctor in town because you're the best girl in the family. It's good to give them high morale, but to make them arrogant? You buy them the best clothes, you buy them the best cars, you buy them the best so they can say you are better than others? Teach them humbleness, humility, to treat others in a nice way, to treat others in a very kind way. That's something very important. One day I was sitting down on a dinner table and I was having a discussion with another couple, both were doctors. And they bought to their 18-year-old's daughter one of the most expensive cars, better than their own cars, better than the cars of the parents. So I said, why did you do that? You're, you're, you're hurting her heart. You're ruining her soul. You're making her arrogant. You're making her conceited. You're making her feel better than others in a materialistic way. You know what she, the, the answer was? I don't want her to feel less than others. What's wrong in feeling less than others when it comes to materialism? What's wrong in feeling that you have less car or less money or less clothes? There's nothing wrong in that. That's actually when you teach them humbleness. Actually, people who have less are nicer. If you, if you go visit your relatives in, in, a, in a village in Palestine or a village in Egypt or in Syria, they will have a very small house and they will welcome you there for three weeks without any problems. They'll tell you to sleep on their beds, they'll give you from their food, and you'll feel so welcome there. And they come to your 3,000 square foot house, you cannot handle them for one day. So teach them humbleness and niceness to others. You need to teach that to your children, otherwise they're not gonna learn it by themselves. They're not gonna learn it from Khutbat al Jum'ah. They're not gonna learn it from YouTube. They'll learn it from you. You teach them humbleness and you be humble as well. Especially sisters. Do not put the more expensive purse on your run. You walk around with your nose up there like, look at me. I'm wearing the most expensive purse. Teach them humbleness. You buy a car to your son. You put the head, the, the chair all the way down and you put the music on and you go around and say, I'm driving the best car. No. Teach them humbleness. Humbleness is very important to be taught and reminded to your children. And finally, Luqman is teaching his son etiquette. This is beautiful. This is a complete advice. He teach him ibadah, aqidah, how to respect the parents, how to be an activist, how to have social manners, and how to have etiquette. You know what? Etiquette like though, like how to be a good person in public. When people meet you, they feel like you have a prestige and you're classy. That's different by being, being arrogant. You can be poor and you can be classy at the same time. You can be humble and you have some etiquette at the same time. How to eat, how to deal in public, how to use the fork and knife, how to uh, eat when your mouth is closed, how to speak in a lower voice. Because Luqman is saying, وَقْصِدْ فِي مَشِيكَ When you walk, walk with a prestige, with classes, with, with tranquility, with calmness, with peace. وَقْضُدْ مِنْ صَوْتِكَ And lower your voice. The worst voices are the voices of the donkeys. So lower your voice, oh my son. He's teaching them person etiquette, social etiquette. The problem, unfortunately, that we face, like someone like me who came from the Middle East, I come from a two extreme pictures 
in those countries. We have the religious people who are, mashallah, praying in the masjid all the time, reading Quran all the time, praying up all the night. But when you deal with them, there is no thawq whatsoever. There is no class. There is no etiquette. On the other hand, you see people who have class, who have, mashallah, polite and gentlemen and ladies, and they, they act in a very nice social etiquette, but they don't pray. They don't practice Islam. They don't wear the hijab. And when you ask them, why are you not doing that? Because I don't want to be like that person. We need both to be combined. You pray at the masjid. You do qiyam al-layl. You fast Mondays and Thursdays. But at the same time, when you deal with people, deal with class, deal with etiquette, deal with social manners, this is a complete advice that Al-Quran has given his son, and that's what we need to remind our children about. There is nothing wrong in sitting down once a week with the family. You know, we spend so many hours watching TV, and me personally, I do not like to waste so much time on TV. My children are not allowed to watch TV except on the weekend for one hour on Saturday and one hour on Sunday, and things that I choose for them. Now, don't go make a revolution at home and say, Dr. Ahmed said that. They will hate me for the rest of their life. But what I'm asking you is limit the amount of TV that's being watched on by your children and by your family. There's so much harm on TV that you're not aware of. You'll be watching an isness and TV show and suddenly a commercial for underwear comes up. What are you going to do with your children? And they're watching. So limit the amount of TV. Never mind. If you're watching two or three hours TV every day, I'm asking you for half an hour a week. Sit down in a circle. You know when you're watching TV all together, you're sitting down like this and you're watching one direction. Ten years later, oh my dad, my God, my father became old man. Because you haven't looked at his face for the last ten years. You're watching TV. But when you sit in a circle once a week, you look at each other. You see the face of your mother. You see the face of your children. If there is something that's bothering you, you can see it in their eyes. Sit down for half an hour once a week and talk about this advice. Recite these verses from the Quran. Repeat them and keep reminding them your children. And they go, Dad, come on, you're boring by this. That's fine. I'm boring, son. I'm boring, daughter. But let's sit down and look what Luqman says. If we sit down for half an hour, after that we all go out for ice cream. Make it something that also fun and rewarding at the end. So, these were some of the advice that we can share with our children after reading the, 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 the advice of Luqman to his son. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us all among those who apply this advice in their lives and be able to talk to our children, raise them up to be the best way. For the teenagers and the young adults who are in the crowd tonight, I would like to tell you few things. Number one, be proud of your faith. Be proud of whom you are. You have the best religion on the face of earth. And you worship Allah, Al-Aziz. Al-Aziz, the one of dignity. You get your dignity from him. Do not be shy of your faith. Do not be embarrassed to say I'm a Muslim. Do not be embarrassed to say I'm fasting in Ramadan. Have, 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 have dignity when it comes to your faith. And number two, your parents. They did so many things to you in your life. Make sure that you do not pay back with disrespect. The, the sad things that I've seen around for daughters yelling at their mothers or son misbehaving with their fathers or yelling at them or arguing with them or completely mistreating them in the worst way possible. That's not what they deserve from you. They deserve a kiss on their hands. They deserve a hug every day. They deserve to make them laugh every single evening with a joke. Even though it's lame, they will laugh. Don't worry about it. Give them jokes every day. Make them be happy every day. And do not wait too long. Look at the brother next to you whose mother passed away several years ago. He will tell you, I will do anything to kiss my mother's hand again. I will do anything to spend another five minutes with my father and give him a hug. Do not waste these precious years of your life and make sure you, make, you treat your parents in the best way way possible because that's what they deserve from you. Do you remember the first day you went to kindergarten when you were kids? You cried so much because you want your mom back. You remember the first day you were lost in the mall? You remember that, right? And you cried so much, where's mom? And when you saw her, you ran, mommy. What happened now? Are you embarrassed from her because she's wearing the hijab? Are you making fun of her accent? Are you, making, are you embarrassed when she talks to you in front of your friends and she kisses you and you start wiping your cheek because she kissed you in front of your friends? They don't deserve that from you. They deserve all the love and the respect 
hugs every day, kisses every day, share with them good news every day, and don't ever make fun of them. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you and bless your families. It was my pleasure to be with you today. If there is uh, any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them for the next few minutes. Otherwise, I think we move forward to the... Yeah. You said that when uh, the kids are watching TV, uh, you've got to limit, it all, limit all the time they watch TV. But at one point, they will grow up and they can have as much TV as they want. Uh, what's your answer to that? I mean, I can prevent I, them from watching TV now. Yeah, so I, get, I get this question all the time to any other things. For example, I, but this is not an advice. This is me personally. Okay. I prevent candy and cookies from my house because I'm a dentist, right? I hate cavities and all that. Um, I don't want to do free dentistry for my children. So I make sure that they don't eat a lot of uh, candies and sugar. And people keep telling me, but when they grow up, they'll eat it. Let them eat it when they grow older. So what? It's not going to be as bad. Uh, they will do things behind your back sometimes, but do not condone it. Do not be the one who's telling them what to do. I'm talking about the bad thing. So yeah, if you if you limit that time, when they grow older, they can do it then. It's not, you cannot limit them all their lives. At some point, they will be free. But, those, but the, the bad things that they could have been harmed with at a young age, you can prevent it easily when limiting those exposures. There's so many bad things on TV. The kids are learning from TV how to yell at their parents. Kids are learning, and now with all the weird things and the crazy things that's going on, kids are learning weird, even more than that. A lot of comedy shows, they have, you know what, uh, men marrying men and all that, and parents are laughing about it. And the child will say, oh, my mom is laughing. No, that's mean, it's good, it's okay. No, it's normal. Just be careful, there is very, and, but I'm, again, do not make a revolution. Don't go home and say, I'm taking the TV out. They will hate you for the rest of your life. Just limit it by giving an alternative. Sports and reading and other stuff together. Question about Halloween. Halloween. <laughs> You've heard about Halloween? My kids want to go to Halloween. You've heard about Halloween? <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> what shall we tell them next Thursday? Uh, next Thursday, have an event in the masjid. Call it Halloween. <laughs> have a, we, I'll tell you what we did in our masjid. Uh, Three years ago, we did reptile show. We brought, uh, there is a company that brings reptiles, snakes and, and that. Kids love it. So they go all came together. Now they're avoiding the stuff outside. Now they can sit down in the masjid. They saw. Next day we got animal show, like uh, parrots and uh, little tigers and all that. You can, it's not that expensive. A few hundred dollars, you can bring it to the masjid and kids will pay for pizza and stuff. So it will pay up for the price. This year we're getting a mini uh, golf tournament inside the masjid. We have a big warehouse, so inside the masjid, mini golf tournament. So have an alternative for the children to come and stay in this gathering. That's not only us, the churches do that as well. Many churches do that as well. So if you cannot do that, uh, I find a way to discuss it with them and how to go out for dinner that day and so no one will... Any other question for the Prophet? We'll have <coughs> How do you explain the words of Ali Nabi Talib? Teach your children different than what you've been taught and raise them up for a different time than your time. Uh, this is, by the way, a very profound and very good word. Yet, yet it's not Ali Nabi Talib who said it, by the way. It's Aflaton who said it. That's one of the biggest misconceptions. Aflaton said that raise up your children in different ways because they were raised up in a different time. And that's very important for us to understand. By the way, a lot of parents in America when they have problems with their children, they blame it that because they live in America. Oh, I live, look, my children are doing this because... No, go back to the Middle East and you'll find the parents have also problems with their children. Because the time is different. The, the, there's a big gap in time. They were raised up. In your time, there was nothing called Facebook. There was nothing called uh, cell phone. There was no internet. The worst um, a, 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 a boy could do with a girl is send her a letter like this, right? You remember those? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, it's open. So the way you deal with them, it has to be a little bit different. You have to look, first of all, you have to have a Facebook account. How many parents have Facebook account? Come on, all of you should have it. Fa parents, you have to have it. You have to understand their lingo and their language. You know, it's one of the funny things that when kids are typing and chatting with their friends on the other side, uh, sometimes they write POS. You know what does that mean? Parent over shoulder. My parents behind me, so do not write anything that will get me in trouble. 
How many? Sorry, I exposed you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so there are things that there are words, there are abbreviations that the kids use, and actually it's against the religion of Islam. Like, uh, oh my God, OMG, right? Sometimes they add a letter in the middle. That's haram. That's kufur. You need to know these things. You need to understand these abbreviations. What do they mean? What did the kid mean? So have have. Be up to date with them. You cannot expect your son to go with you to the field and cut the uh, teen and the zaytun and the olives and all. They're not going to do that. But you have to live with their times and try to be understanding. So yes, this is a very important message and an advice that all of us should appreciate and understand it. The hijab for your daughter is not the hijab for you. It's different, different style, different fashion, different. Yes, hijab is a, is a, is a principle, but she, she doesn't have to wear a jilbab like the one that you, your mother bought you. They have different style and different, the same thing for the brother. So, and then kids nowadays are learning things at early age. Do not say, I did not learn this out until I was 30. That's not an advice. That's not an excuse. They learn it at younger age. So yes, thank you for sharing this with us. And I hope I answered it well. Just one last thank you very much. Yeah. How do you stop the kids overusing the social media? Why do you want to stop them? No, but that I means and it's also everything in access is bad. There Not the, oh, first, there are so many technological ways of, of guarding your computer at home. Do not, in my, my, my personal, my, well, this is what I do. The main computer in the house is put right in front of me when I'm sitting down in the living room. Well, when they are on the iPhone, they are doing it all the time. Even if you are taking them with any family dinner, but what they are doing, then, then the advice that Luqman said that Allah is watching you all the time should be implemented in their hearts all their lives. Don't come at the age of 17 and expect to fix things. It should start from a young age. all right. But little by little, gradually, and there is nothing wrong in telling your son very clearly, son, these websites are haram. You know when you watch these websites, your eyes will be punished in the hereafter. Tell them that very clearly. Scare them out. That's fine. Tell them about, you know, those kids who do drugs, they will be in big trouble. And, and be frank and open in the things that they're doing. Don't be shy of discussing things. So that, always be self-accountability, that they're always aware of what are the things that, are, uh, that Allah is watching them all the time. Number one. Number two, from young age, you give them room in doing things and do not be controlling over them all the time. Otherwise, the minute they... Uh, are on their own, they feel freedom and they go to the extreme. But again, they will do mistakes. Don't forget that. Don't lose hope. They will do mistakes. Inshallah, they will come back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. That's why we love to have him here all the time. So, did everybody like the lecture? Thank you very much for coming. He has other commitments. Unfortunately, he has to leave us. But we wish him... Uh, Good luck, and uh, I thought I knew how to raise my children after this lecture. No, no, no. I have to rethink about it. <laughs> Thank you very much, May Allah bless you. Bless you, Allah bless you, bless your children all. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.